seven to order. Um, would the clerk please call the roll? Uh, Alderman Laurie Wilshire. Here. Alderman Brian McCarthy. Present. Alderman Michael O'Brien is present. Alderman Sean McGinnis is absent. Alderman David Shoneman is absent. Alderman Ken Siegel is absent. And, and the chair, Alderman present. Dowd, is present. Okay, I, I know that Alderman Siegel is out of town on business and uh, will not be able to join us this evening. So public hearing is on R-17097, which is authorizing the mayor and the city treasurer to issue bonds not to exceed the amount of $1,200,000 for roof replacement work at Fairgrounds Middle School and Ledge Street Elementary School. Let the record show that Alderman Shoneman showed up at 701. Um, so before we get started, we'll have Sean Smith come up from the school department and explain the project so that the public and everyone knows what we're discussing. If you want to just come up and take a seat. Any of the first three are open. So name and position for the record and if you could just give us an overview of the project, how it came to be. Okay. Sean Smith, I'm the plan operations director for the school district in Nashua. Um, so Fairgrounds Middle School was last renovated in the mid-90s. Um, most of the roof was replaced at that time, to my knowledge. Uh, the vast majority of it, it was uh, made of a PVC material. Uh, over time, that particular material has shown that it's subject to cracking and splitting. We uh, recently replaced the roof at Dr. Crisp. It was made of the same material, and that lasted about the same amount of time. Uh, Condition of the roof was exacerbated a few winters ago when we had uh, a bunch of contractors uh, you know, shoveling the snow off the roof. They added additional holes and cracks. Uh, they were required to patch them, but those patches don't seem to last. What we did in that area is we actually bought a big piece of rubber and it's being held over that space with uh, paper blocks. Um, some of the other sections of the roof are actually EPDM. Uh, over the tech ed side, which is your face in the school, it's on our right hand side. Also, gymnasium. Uh, the gymnasium material is EPDM or, or rubber, and it's uh, was adhered at one time, but it's no longer adhered, and it's so every time you have a wind blowing across it, it physically flops. We went to the landfill uh, uh, about a month ago and got a bunch of retired tires, and those are holding down the rubber roof at this point. Um, the, we hired a consultant uh, this past winter, and they are doing a, assessments of our schools kind of on the fly as we, as we direct them. The first effort was to look at Fairgrounds Middle School. Uh, they came out with a report, uh, which I have electronically. I'd be happy to share it with everybody. I think uh, gave Mr. Dowd a copy. Mm -hmm. um, and that just reflected everything I've just told you. It's, it's cracking, it's splitting, it uh, really needs replacement. Uh, I, when I did my computations, I, I used the consultant's recommendations for cost. And I guess that's about the, the summary. Okay. Very good. Uh, before we ask for input, uh, is there any questions from any of the budget committee members who would like to get more information? Alden O'Brien. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Smith, uh, we did have a problem with the past with the Hunt Community Building with their roof and the uh, warranty of the work that was done. And when we do this project, as we should with all projects, is there going to be a warranty? Who holds on for the city with that warranty? Just to make sure we do have a flaw in the future and if it's within the uh, life expectancy that uh, it just doesn't uh, get lost in the shuffle. Definitely. All the roofing projects that I've overseen, we've required a 20-year warranty on the roof. Um, that warranty at Fairgrounds Middle School, I don't think it was 20 years, something less than that, but it's long since expired. So does the warranty get voided if you're up there with shovels and other instruments to getting snow off the roof? Uh, the only time I've, it wasn't, a, well, it's already expired at the time that we were up there with the shovels. No, I'm thinking um, about the new roof. <laughs> uh, with the new roof, I probably would not even use that same method again. Most of the 
contractors were not roofers, they were just people hired off, seemingly, seemingly hired off the street, and their concern was not the roof uh, material, but uh, just getting the snow off. So I've, actually with my own in-house people, we've been using snow blowers. Um, that's a lot easier on the roof material, as long as you're not on a really pitched roof. But like Broad Street, that's how we get rid of the snow on that roof. So okay. hopefully I answered the question. Mr. Chairman. Yes, <coughs> Alderman Shoneman. Um, I heard you say, uh, thank you, um, that Fairgrounds was last renovated or the roof was done in mid-90s, is that correct? That's correct. And what, did I miss Ledge Street? When was Ledge Street done? Um, Ledge Street uh, was last renovated also in the early 90s. We did a mechanical renovation a few years ago uh, that uh, I don't recall if we did any roofs with that particular project. I know we did it in Charlotte. Um, but really, the, the mid early 90s was the last time ledge was fully renovated. Uh, all we're doing with that piece is replacing the membrane over the boiler room. That's probably $25,000 of the, of the total. That's all we're doing for Ledge Street is that one section of the boiler yes. room. So the majority of this is for Fairgrounds. Yes. And it's the full roof at Fairgrounds. Yeah. Well, everything except for the shingled roofs, which we just did the last few years. And may I ask? Follow-up? Yes. Um, when, given kind of how we do things, when do you think Fairgrounds would be up for a complete renovation again? We, we, we seem to be running about uh, 25 or 30 years between renovations. It's not on my list of the next five schools at this point. So if it's done in the early 90s, it's about 25, 20 years. Talking about Ledge Street or Fairgrounds? Uh, Fairgrounds. Fairgrounds, yes, about 20 years. About 20 years so A little so bit over. Thanks. President McCarthy? Yeah, it was actually done in 96 ish, so it's just about exactly 20 years. We're doing the whole roof at Fairgrounds? Everything except for the shingled roofs, uh, which on we've done the, the last the few peak, years. Those are the peak roofs on the additions? Correct. I thought uh, there was one section that we didn't do when we did the renovations, I thought, like the gym or something like that. Um, records I have mid 90s, but I okay. really started to put them together once I got here. And that, that roof was worn out already? I'm kind, of, I'm kind of surprised that that's failing at this point. The PVC is, that material doesn't, when I've seen I'd never put on another roof again. Um, the rubber is a little surprising. It's holding up, on the gym it's just it's just flopping. Whatever, however it was adhered before is not working. Um, actually the way I've kind of divvied up the project, uh, we'd be doing the other portions like above the tech head space is, is alternates to the project. Uh, so we have still have the option of looking at them one more time and deciding not to. But the, our consultant suggested they're close to being, need to, need to be replaced. All set. Alderman LeBrun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if this roof is in, in that uh, type of condition, do you foresee any uh, structural damage under the roofing material? Does this estimate uh, take that into consideration? It, it, not the structural. It, it does take into account that the um, insulation has probably failed. You can actually hear it when you walk across. It's a very crunching sound. We don't expect anything to be uh, wrong with the structure itself, though. In fact, Thank I you. asked the consultant, you know, should we look at that as a separate issue, and they thought not. Thank you. All set. In that case, I will call for testimony in favor of R-17097. Seeing none, I'll ask for testimony in opposition. Seeing none. Once again, testimony in favor. None. Testimony in opposition. Seeing none. So I'll declare the public hearing closed at 7.09 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We will now conduct a regular meeting of the budget. We've conducted the roll call and, and had the public hearing. Um, public comment. Seeing none. Uh, communications. Um, I, sh 
I see none. Okay. And now we will conduct our first department this evening will be Community Development Division. Director Marshan want to come up and you can call your people up in any order or bring them up. It's up to you. So in this year's budget book, In this year's budget book, we got a pretty comprehensive overview of all the departments, including community development. I assume that the mayor probably had you guys write it. Yes. <laughs> so all the members have read that. So I would ask the, to give an overview of the budget, what's gone up, what's gone down, um, and then we'll see if people have questions relative. We'll go, I guess, by each sub-department in your area. So if you'd like to open it up. Thank you so much. So my name is Sarah Marchant, the Community Development Division Director. And I will just quickly introduce my team here. And what we'd kind of like to do is run through um, in each department revenue and um, the appropriations budget together right. instead of just going through revenue first, if possible. So um, first is Roger Houston, Planning Department, uh, Bill McKinney, Building Safety, Nelson Ortega, Code Enforcement, Carrie Skeena, Urban Programs, Camille Pattison, Transportation, and Janet Graziano, our financial manager. So we can, do you just want to roll through as starting with building? Is on your agenda? Okay. Take it away, Bill. <laughs> Bill McKinney with the uh, Department of Building Safety. I'm the manager of that department, also the building official for the city of Nashua. Um, reference to the, to the upcoming uh, fiscal year 18, Looking at um, building inspections revenue projections, we've um, projected a 3.4% increase in our revenues over uh, fiscal year 2017, which would increase that amount um, from 455600 to 400071 Do we have any questions? Can you give me that again, please? That, that would increase that line from um, over FY17 from $455,600 to $471,000. It's a 3.4% increase. Um, okay. 52. 52, I'm sorry. Yes. So, uh, uh, do you want to go through the other part of the budget first, or do you want to just address can. revenues? Certainly. We can certainly go to... Our expend expenditures, which would be page 229, I believe. Mm As you can see on this budget here, our, aside from uh, wages and um, benefits, which we have uh, very little control over due to contractual agreements, um, the only line that uh, we are looking at is a is a new item under other services, which is line 55100, and that's for communications data. And what that would be is to um, add three additional tablets to our department. Uh, we currently have two tablets now. Um, with the implementation of a new um, permitting software that's co hopefully coming online in 2018. Um, that'll allow for our inspectors to be more mobile, and they'll be able to do field inspections and enter data in the field rather than spending a lot of their um, downtime in the office. They'll be able to be more useful and more efficient out in the field. Okay. And there are no other uh, changes to our um, expense budgets over that. All right. And does anyone on the budget committee have questions of <coughs> uh, building an inspection? Alderman 
Well, so, Brian. And thank you. Uh, Mr. McKinney, uh, that uh, 55100 line item that you mentioned with the uh, tablets and everything, that's going to be right for now. Uh, it won't appear like in next year's budget or something because so the life expectancy of those tablets should still be good, correct? And no, actually, that is for the um, uh, annual service contract for the um, actual so the data okay. plan. Yes, yeah, okay. so we, we currently have two on the plan. Um, those those you'll see are in 55118 in that line. Uh, for okay. $720 um, this year. Uh, that's now being moved into, um, to make it more clear, it's a communications and data service plan for um, all five all five tablets. Okay. Okay. Alderman Lopez, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, has looked like there's an increase in, in revenue. Was any of that due to the changes in code enforcement um, fining? No, we do not include those in projected revenue because uh, that the that is actually a deterrent tool rather than an income tool. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for um, the information and the update. And I'll note, as you noted in the beginning, that the things that are causing increases here are things that we we do have control over, but not right now. That's the contracts. I'll right. note that the um, the wages for the full time went up. Just looks like three thousand three thousand dollars from three ninety six to three ninety nine, but the benefits went up from ninety one to one hundred fourteen. So we're adding little to full time wages, but we're adding considerably more to benefits, and I suspect we're going to see that in a lot of the other departments as well. Yes, sir. So it's something we'll have to work on as we get contracts in in the future. Our, um, these are probably just, Sorry, just, I just want a quick question. These are step increases on the non-affiliated? These would be, uh, the majority of my division is UAW, um, either professional oh, or clerical technical. Okay. All right. um, so those would be increases um, that were budgeted as part of that. And then also more the benefits side of things and then merit, there's some merit okay. positions, yes. Alderman Lusher, did you have a question? No. <clears throat> Any other questions for um, building inspection? No? Director Marshan, you're next. Um, code hmm? enforcement is up next. And they do have a um, very, they don't have, but um, in case you want to look at it, a, page 53, revenue, because it is listed in your book. Um, I'll hand it over to. Good evening. I'm Nelson Ortega, the code enforcement manager. Um, as far as our budget, we we have a little bit of a change in ours, which is not the norm. Um, we do have, from issuing violations, we do have uh, $1,150. But again, that's for individuals who decided that they didn't want to comply. So. That's what, and that's just some tickets that doubled up because they didn't pay them on time. As far as the actual numbers, we also have a data and communications line that we added because we're going to have two tablets, um, and that's at 960, which is also maintenance uh, for the data and so forth for the year. The only other increase that you'll see in ours is um, the city is – um, picking up, uh, we have an empty uh, vacant position for a code officer who left, um, and we have to fill the position. So the city will be picking up half of that salary for that code officer um, since the, uh, it's a grant position. And uh, the grant, Carrie can probably explain more on that, since, uh, uh, but they're not getting the, they, they may not likely get the full grant for uh, the next coming three years. Am I, am I correct in that? Somewhat. The, we yeah. reapplied for a lead grant, which was covering the code enforcement officer position um, as a full-time position previously. The grant that we're waiting to hear about um, HUD lowered the amount we could apply for. So across the board, there was just less available than our current grant. Just for the person that's transcribing, can you give sure. us your name? <laughs> My apologies. Carrie Skeena, Manager of Urban Programs. Okay. Thank you. And other than that, our budget is the other increase is just the salaries for the contract UAW employees. Okay. Questions? Okay. 
Seeing none, Director Martian. All right, hydroelectric operations, and that's actually going to be me. Um, Madeline Minow is still on maternity leave. So revenues, page 54, um, and you'll see a large increase in that as we uh, purchased Mine Falls Dam on April 13th, which was a memo that you guys got. So we are expecting significant increase in revenue in 18. We also, um, the other big change for Jackson in um, look going into 18 that we did halfway through 17 was that we're net metering Jackson now. And so instead of um, being paid on the daily rate market, we're being paid a much higher rate through a net metering contract. So um, there's significantly higher revenues there. And we hope that the drought is over, which makes a big difference for us. <laughs> um, the, uh, the budget side is page 233. Um, that is uh, up significantly um, because of the purchase of Mine Falls. Um, as part of the purchase of that, we went through that report with H.L. Turner. There are some major capital improvements that need to happen and that we've budgeted over several years, uh, kind of like an internal CIP, to bring that dam up to um, fully running operating capacity without any issues. And so um, there are some, that's why the line that says dam operating and maintenance, it includes our contract with our operator. Um, that was signed last year, but it also includes some kind of capital fixes um, that are, we're working on right now um, and into 2718, excuse me. So overall, it's still a positive net income. It, it will overall be a positive net income, That's yes. Yeah. Anticipated, yes. Okay. Barring major drought or something. Questions? Alderman Shoneman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on that same line, that dam operating and maintenance services, I see the actual through 331 is only 82,000. Um, is that is that not prorated? Or would you expect something larger, or is that because of the contract change? Why is it only 82 if we budgeted 206? Yeah, excellent question. Um, it um, Part of that, 50,000 of that was interconnection um, at Jackson Falls that we're still working with Eversource on that we're hoping to escrow this year because it should be done <laughs> um, sooner. And also because there was so little flow, part of our payment to them is based off of a percentage of revenue. Um, in the previous contract, it was 20%. In the new contract, it's 10%. So um, the, the amount we're paying out was significantly less because there wasn't any water. We were not making any money, or much less. Yeah. Follow up? Yes, please. Um, the projected revenue then of 398. I'm sorry. Um, projected cost of 398. Is that based on? Is that based on water flow too? It is. Yes. And so it's it's based on what we expect actually expect with water flow. Yes. Okay. Over average of we have um, an average of about 12 years for both dams that we're kind of pulling from. Thank you. Yep. So based on all the current uh, rain we've had lately and the fact that the area is three inches over a yearly norm at this point, I would assume we're in pretty good position from a flow standpoint. We are doing fine from a flow standpoint at this moment, yep. And the long-term forecasts um, look re very reasonable. Well, we will still have our normal summer low and we should peak again in the fall, but the spring peak went very well. Okay. Any other questions for hydroelectric? Okay, Director Marshawn, you're next. That would be me again, and um, only on the budgets, only on the appropriation side, no revenue. Um, the only changes to community development are under um, 53 professional technical services for stenographic services. The new energy, Environment and Energy Committee was brought on board this year. Um, they have started meeting. They are a pretty fabulous group. Uh, Michael Seidel is chairing them, and they are energetic and excited and just trying to help them get focused with all that energy. So um, using, um, that would be stenographic services for their minutes. And then the other, the very large item change is um, under other services, other contracted services, there's $66,000 in there. And that is um, the second half of the invasive species spraying contract. So last year we were lucky enough to map the invasive species in the National River with New Hampshire DES. And um, this year we are hoping to really attack that. The first half of it's coming out of money from 2017, FY17, and the second half will be 18. We hope those sprays will start shortly, June 8th. Okay. Alderman Schoenman. Thank you. On the invasive species contract, other contracted services, will this, is this a two-year program or is it ongoing? We expect these kinds of amounts every year. Um, we're really hoping that they should be significantly less net 
less next year. This is a one year kind of hit it hard. There'll be four treatments over this season. Um, after this, because it was so very um, bad last year, we, we did great taking out the um, water chestnuts, but the milfoil and fanwort came in very intensely. And so we're hoping by hitting it really hard this year with this, we can, and then do maybe just one treatment next year. Um, so hopefully it'll be significantly less next year, but we, we don't expect it to be zero. Okay. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Okay. Next. All right. Planning and zoning. Roger. Right. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Roger Houston, Planning Director. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, page 55 is the uh, Planning Department's revenue page. Um, we've looked at increasing the revenues by approximately 6% uh, based on the revenues we've received over the last couple of years. And we think that's a conservative estimate. Uh, we hopefully will have more, but to be on a conservative side, we've uh, kept it at that. Um, any questions? Our, there's a lot of new development going on. Is that in the projection? Uh, yes. So we... It, it's hard to tell how much of it's going to come in and how much is going to be realized. Sometimes we'll get a project in June that we do all the work for in the next budget mm-hmm. cycle. Right. So it's it's sometimes difficult to uh, project the revenues. But uh, last year we had 236000 year before 196000 in revenues. Uh, so from a conservative point of view, we feel that this is a good number. Okay. But anything can happen because we can't control the applications, if you will. And you're covering planning and zoning, right? Planning, zoning, historic district commission, and conservation commission, and the capital improvements <laughs> committee. I mean, right now, or are you? It's all of it. That's all, all of it. it. <laughs> okay. I have a question. On the historic district commission, the revenues were up. Or there's some reason. Um. Typically, we have about seven applications. I, I think we had one extra one. Uh, it's really hit and miss. I think we had more projects in the HDC last year than... Uh, the question I had was, I was just curious if any of that was related to the fact that they're trying to expand the Historic District Commission. No. I mean, area. No. I think the only expansion they're looking at is the Greeley Park area for the time being. So that shouldn't impact since the city doesn't collect fees from its own agencies. Okay. Other questions? Planning and Zoning Historic District. Uh, Moving moving on to page uh, 236, which is the operating side. as Alderman Showman pointed out, uh, the lion's share of it is the fringe benefits. I think ours are 22,000 increase, uh, roughly. The rest is uh, um, salaries, and we looked at uh, a couple of minor increases on the commodity side. One is on um, uh, the postage and delivery. Uh, we increased that by 800. In FY15, we were over budget. It was 9,700 versus uh, budgeted uh, 9,100. Um, and last year, we were okay. Uh, postage rates are going up, and we do a lot. Of, most of our postage expenses are certified notices for Planning Board, Zoning Board, and H, uh, Historic District Commission. And it really, it's a sometimes a hit and miss. I, I think one year we had over 14, nearly 15,000 in postage costs, just on, depending on how many applications you got. If you get the airport coming in with a lot of airport hangers, that's a large abutters list that we have to cover the postage on. So mm-hmm. I try to be conservative in our estimates, and that's why I bumped that up slightly. Um, we had uh, under training, uh, that was bumped up basically $800, <coughs> excuse me, 800 uh, with travel costs going up, and uh, we have a lot of interest with uh, zoning board members and planning board members attending uh, some training exercises, uh, OEP, and some uh, the municipal law lecture series. So, and that covers all the training for all the uh, five boards and commissions that we oversee. Okay. And that's that's basically it. Questions. Thank 
you. All right. Marsha, you next? All right, Urban Programs, Carrie. Hi, Carrie Skeena, again, Urban Programs Manager. Um, my budget is on page 239 and, uh, well, 227, and then the bulk of it on starting on page 239. Uh, the revenues that are shown as part of urban programs are actually grant, uh, we're entirely grant funded in this department, um, predominantly through HUD, and we have entitlement grants that come through each year. That's the CDBG and Home Program. And then we also currently have a competitive lead paint grant from HUD. And um, Manager Ortega started to allude to the fact that we're currently, we're winding down our existing lead grant and waiting to hear, hopefully in June or July, whether or not the new application will be funded. Um, the department goes through a process where we um, obtain a lot of public input and it ends up going through Human Affairs Committee to um, dole out the funds to uh, not just the city but also a lot of the nonprofits in the community and that process just concluded last week actually so that will um, that resolution will be going back through the full board likely um, at the next meeting so much like the other departments the changes in urban programs are um, generally through wages we don't have our allocations from HUD at this point. The national budget was just, um, or our piece of it was just passed a couple weeks ago, so we're waiting on that. And we just estimated level funding. So other than wages, there are um, no changes within our budget, except that it looks like it went down because our current lead grant goes through November, so we only have it projected for those five months. Um, but certainly if we get the new grant, it would bring it back up to last year's amounts. Okay. Alderman Wilshire. I have a question about the lead grant. Do we know how much less we would be getting? I mean, did they give you some guidance? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the our current grant right now is $3.4 million, and the max that we could apply for under the most recent round was 2.9. Thank you. So it's 500000 less. Okay. Other questions? Seeing none. Moving right along. All right. Last but not least, transportation. Okay. Uh, Camille Pattison, manager of transportation department and uh, Nashua Transit. So our budget is largely funded through the Federal Transportation Administration, or FTA. Uh, there's a couple revenue sources on page 243 I'll draw your attention to. We're anticipating a decrease in auxiliary transport advertising. This is the company we contract with that does the advertising on our buses and our shelters. Um, we are getting a new fleet in November, and in part of that, we have to change the artwork out from the buses, and we are anticipating um, a decrease in that simply due to the timing and the, some of the costs of that. The other one is the UPASS, which is the contract that we've got with some of the colleges and community college in the city of Nashua. And Daniel Wester College closed um, as of Saturday with the commencement, so they are no longer participating. And there's also been a decrease from Riviere as well because they've lost a significant amount of their international students. So those are two, we anticipate a decrease. Um, as far as our expenses going forward, in the fuel item, which is actually on the next page, 244, we're anticipating a slight increase because we're switching with the new bus fleet from biodiesel to CNG. And then about a year from now, our vans will be going from biodiesel to gas. So there's a slight increase um, due to that, at least anticipated. Uh, and then the other significant Actually, as a benefit, it's a decrease in vehicle supplies. We're anticipating about $40,000 less in expenditures, largely because we have a very aging bus fleet now, and when the new bus fleet comes in November, they'll all be new, they shouldn't have many issues, and it will be under warranty. Um, so those are the, the changes. And the one other thing uh, that we will be adding is a full-time transit utility worker. Um, it will take more time to fuel the CNG buses, and we need to make sure we're on top of cleaning the new facilities and the new buses. So um, they will be added in. But the um, additional um, savings that we're anticipating, you know, even out with that position. Okay. Questions? Alderman Schoenman. Thank you. Uh, can you please talk about the fuel again? Uh, this compressed natural gas. So right now we have um, nine. We have nine full size buses, the big blue buses you see. One of them is on compressed natural gas. The rest are on biodiesel. But when the new buses come, they'll all be on biodiesel. Or sorry, compressed natural gas. We'll have nine CNG, and then the only things will be left on biodiesel will be the three trolleys. And eventually, the vans we have will all transition out. Uh, vans are currently on biodiesel. They don't make them on biodiesel anymore. They're all transitioning to gas. 
So because of that, there's you know some wiggle room with the fueling costs. We've estimated them as best we can. Follow up. Thank you. Um, when you say gas, you mean you don't mean gasoline. You mean compressed natural gas. No, the gasoline. vans are okay. gasoline. Yeah, gasoline. the small right. vans. So we have yeah. gasoline. The smaller vans aren't gas. We'll be on gasoline. Yeah. And all the buses are going to be on CNG. Compressed natural gas. And yes. you said that you're anticipating a fuel cost increase because of that change. About eight thousand dollars is what we're anticipating. Yeah. Total. Yep. Okay. And um, do we know kind of overall what the what the cost impact is of of switching the fuels? You talked about human resources. There was a person you had one extra right. person for a period of time, but maybe some credit somewhere. Um, do we know what the overall cost of using compressed natural gas? is compared to what we've been doing. Just, I think folks ought to know that, yeah. you know, I'm sure they like seeing the CNG buses right. around, but but what does it cost us to do that? Because it's it's not less money, it's more money. No, it's more money. The, right now, the uh, the price per gallon is higher on compressed natural gas than it is on the biodiesel. Again, those fluctuate, right? So the estimates, that, the projections that we have are based on the best information we have now when we anticipate going into the future. Um, the mileage is a slightly less that you get on a compressed natural gas vehicle, and the oil is a little bit more expensive. I think the reality is until we have them for a year and we really see how they're operating, you know, then we'll have a better sense of exactly what that cost is. Um, but you know, right now it, it is going to cost us a little bit more. And the the other issue is just the fueling. It costs. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fuel a CNG bus, whereas a biodiesel is probably half of that. So when the buses come in the end of the night you know, 1030, typically now we have the last person leave within an hour. Now they've got to clean three buses at the end of the night and fuel them and they each take a half hour to fuel. It's going to take longer. So there's some staffing changes we've got to come up with. You know, will they, what, what shift will that person work to accommodate it? If I may, Mr. Chairman, just one more yes. on that, uh, on that transition um, cost. What about the, the cost of maintenance on CNG versus diesel and the cost of acquiring a bus? My understanding on the cost of maintenance, it's about the same. The mechanics have not indicated anything more. Um, on the cost of the buses, Sarah, you were involved in the purchasing. You might know more on that. Yeah, I think they were, um, it's a good question. I think they were $40,000 uh, more than the diesel. It was an increased cost. We did get um, additional matching funds from the state and FTA because we, sent with, we went with CNG. Did that offset the full $40,000? No, um, but it did help offset some of it. Um, I think that the city's um, has is in a long-term contract for the CNG, and I think when we originally kind of started down this road, diesel prices were significantly higher than they are now, and they were significantly higher than CNG prices, um, and so they, they kind of go back and forth, um, and so we will we'll see. There is there are environmental benefits. They're much quieter. Mm -hmm. We're actually looking for, <laughs> we actually believe the quality of the air um, and being at the transit center will be increased, but there certainly are significant costs associated with going to CNG. And that's one of the reasons why we, the only options for the vans were CNG or gas. Mm -hmm. And we want a diverse fleet. We feel like that's a really important thing. And so we're looking at gas because they were significantly more for that as well. Follow up, all of you sure. Thank you. One of the things I think we hope to do with establishing the CNG fueling farm was to sell CNG to other mm -hmm. users. Are we doing any of that? Is it? You know, I don't actually know. Um, DPW is actually they're doing runs it? Okay. that and is in charge of that facility. They're in charge of the contract because they started with the the garbage trucks, waste trucks. Um, yeah. Save that question <laughs> for BPW. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Oh, President McCarthy. Yeah, I, th I thought we were selling uh, CNG to UPS was the major contract that we were looking at. But on, on the, so did you say they're not making biodiesel replacement? For the vans, the small yeah. vans? No, they're not anymore. So they had been doing diesel, but what it, uh, what we found out when we went out for procurement was that the amount of R&D that goes into the diesel and the amount that they were selling, it wasn't cost effective. So they've all transitioned to gasoline, and you can retrofit them to be, um, can you know, to run on CNG, but the they only last five or seven years, and the general consensus seems to be people don't really convert them. It's not cost effective for the limited time frame that they've got them. It's not like a large bus that you have for 12 years, so people typically don't put it in. So we, we talked about biodiesel versus CNG, but what? How does CNG compare to, to regular diesel? As far as cost-wise. Uh, 
So my estimates right now, I don't have the number right in front of me, but my best of my knowledge, the CNG is about $224 um, a gallon, and the cost of the biodiesel is about $184 right now. But again, they fluctuate. No, you know? What what about regular diesel fuel? If we, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get a benchmark for if we oh, hadn't plain done anything. Diesel? With... You know, I don't know in plain diesel because we don't use it. So I don't have a reference on that one. Any other questions? Director Marsha? That's our whole division. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you for coming. Alderman Shulman? May I ask one question of Director Marchand? Sure. Um, before she departs. Um, and it, I think it, it applies to all the departments, but I was looking at um, just dues and memberships. Um, are these departmental dues and departmental memberships? Or are these individual employee dues to organizations and memberships to organizations? Um, they are generally all the employees belong to the local dues um, organizations, and so that is the dues and memberships that cover all the employees for the local okay. groups and associations. So like all the building inspectors are part of the building association, all the planning department members are part of the planning associations. So it's to cover several individuals, yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, all oh yes. McCarthy. Is there anything that your division really needs that isn't in the budget? Um, <laughs> it's kind of a dangerous question. <laughs> um, I think that I have, this is um, the second budget I've actively participated in, third that I've been responsible for. We cut every year based on wages. Uh, every year we cut and cut to make better, to better fit what we need to, to meet the cap, to make the wages work. Um, and so I think that there are things that we, we are looking at efficiencies. We've looked at different ways to save money. Um, I don't think that there, there are larger capital things. We're working on the Riverfront Master Plan. Um, we're really excited about that. That should be done. We're looking forward to finding ways to fund some of those improvements. And we do know that the Master Plan is looming out there as the whole entity that really needs to be funded at some point. Um, but at this time... I think the overall, all of us just keep making adjustments down everywhere um, to meet what we need to meet. Alderman Lopez. Um, there was some discussion in a previous meeting about looking into the possibility of adding um, dimensions of service to the um, transportation, the city bus. Um, and I know we talked about some more sophisticated things like tracking apps and that kind of stuff, but is there a plan and is it in the budget to just add the ability to process a debit card when you're buying? Oh, that's a great buses. question. Great question. Use check or, mm -hmm, or cash, cash. Yeah. exact cash. Right, so we have it in there as a short-term goal to start looking into that and see what it's going to cost. Honestly, when I've been to trade shows, I've seen all sorts of numbers. You know, I've seen it's $80,000 to get something implemented, and then I've had other people say, oh, well, you know, we can do it for 10 or 20. I honestly don't know, but we're having a new staff person hopefully start, and I'm hoping to, you know, get that on there as a big priority to look into it, because I agree. I mean, that's what people expect. It, well, is that in reference to multiple stations and being able to do it at the bus, or is that just the bus station being able to buy bus passes from the office? Multiple and at the bus. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All set? Yep, thank you. One other quick question for the house. Anything in the budget for replacing that uh, zoning board stop sign for timing? They don't make those anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> they still use them in Supreme Courts, not the same kind. We're, but. we're, we're, we're looking. We had another city approach us, uh, the town of Bedford, wanting to know where we uh, got ours, and they were having a hard time finding one similar to that. So um, <coughs> it still functions, um, but uh, eventually um, it's been a useful little device to help control, the, as you know, the, the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I instituted it like, what, 16 years ago? It's been a, been well, a, yeah, yeah, a few yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Director Marsha, and all of your people that were here tonight. The uh, next group that uh, the division that we're going to go through is Public Health and Community Services on page 175, and the revenues are on pages 43 through 45.
Director Bagley, if you want to give us an overview. Again, we have that uh, written definition of your services in the front of the book here. But uh, if you want to just give us a brief overview and uh, then introduce your people one at a time for the different groups. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Board, for having us this evening. I'm Bobby Bagley, Division Director, and I'm here with the managers of our Division of Public Health and Community Services. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce the managers here that are with me. Janet's on the end, our finance manager. Heidi Peake here from um, Environmental Health, who's our health officer. Jackie Aguilar, who's our manager for our community health department. And Bob Mack, who's our welfare officer and our manager for our welfare department. I just wanted to give um, just a brief overview, but I did want to announce uh, the uh, accreditation of our health department. That was one of the objectives or one of the accomplishments that we had listed in our narrative. And um, in the narrative, it states that we had a site visit by our national accrediting board, and we actually did receive accreditation on um, March 14th. And so that was one of the nice additions for this staff of dedicated folks at the division that I did want to make the alderman aware of. Uh, basically, we came in under budget as requested. However, as you will see in our budget in our different departments, we do have some increases and some decreases, most of which are related to staffing. We did have, um, during the course of the year, a status change with our staff, going from exempt to non-exempt status, which required us to make um, some decisions around uh, staffing uh, for our budget. What I'll do is have each one of the managers go into the specifics of those changes with their staffing, but basically we had to um, look at how the salaries were going to impact our overall budget and then try to make provisions for overtime because of staff that was previously exempt becoming non-exempt and um, needing to make sure that we would be available to provide the services that we do for our city on, on an all-call basis. And there were some changes that were made uh, to each of the departments based on that, with an increase in community health uh, for staffing for overtime, a decrease in um, a welfare department based on a loss of a position, and uh, increase where you see an overtime line, and in environmental health, a decrease in several line items to account for staff overtime. Uh, we requested a certain amount, but it was not proposed in the budget. And as I said, the managers will go through the specific of each one of those. I'll start first with community services. That's the department that I manage. And basically in that uh, budget, the only significant increase that you'll see in there um, is on page... Um, let's see, so. While you're looking for that, I noticed all your revenue stayed flat from last year. So. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so on page 183 of the Budget for Community Services, there was an increase in um, uh, one of our expense lines, 68320, with a change or community intervention. That increased from 5000 to 10000 to uh, accommodate for some of the services that have picked up over the course of this fiscal year. So we anticipate going into fiscal year 2018 to see uh, those same services probably at that same rate, if not increased, delivered. And so we asked for an increase um, in that department there. And pretty much that was the only increase that was there for that budget. Okay, thank you very much. And what's the next? So we'll start with um, Heidi Peak in environmental health. Okay. Good evening. Uh, as Bobby said, my name is Heidi Peak. I am the health officer for the city and the manager of the environmental health department. Um, our revenues did pretty much stay, God bless you, flat. Um, our biggest revenue source are uh, food service licenses, and it's such a fickle market that it's really hard to gauge whether or not um, we're going to see more come in or not. Uh, so that's the one that some decisions have been made. We've seen a little bit more as far as um, septic, but that's um, that's based on the activity that's going on out there um, with land development. Uh, 
as Bobby said, we had, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how to deal with people who now earn overtime, which is a very new thing for us. Um, that came into effect um, the beginning of March, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we've spent probably just under $250 so far. Um, we reduced some items in our budget um, to try and offset um, what we projected for a, an overtime need. Uh, first of those was uh, consulting services. We dropped that by $1,000 for Dragon Mosquito. Um, and, um, sorry, I'm wrong glasses for this. Our conferences and seminars and um, our educational materials. Uh, two things that we dropped because it just made sense because we have newer vehicles is our um, equipment repair for our vehicles and the maintenance and um, also uh, our mileage reimbursements because we're, it's, it's a luxury for us to have three city vehicles that are fairly new and run well and don't have a lot of problems. So we appreciate that. Questions? President McCarthy. So you're dropping the maintenance on the vehicles because they're in good shape this year? Yes. What are we gonna do in the year when they're not in good shape? Well, they're, they're the newest cars we've had. Um, so I expect that they're going to do pretty well for a few years. Um, they're um, very fuel efficient. They're, there haven't been a lot of problems with them. We, we had been previously saddled with a couple of vehicles that uh, uh, probably shouldn't have bought in the first place, but we checked these out pretty thoroughly. How are we doing just routine maintenance like oil changes? That's fine. Very often we find that uh, DPW doesn't charge us for a lot of those things. They're treated as if they're, you know, just a, another part of the fleet. Okay. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next we'll hear from Jackie Aguilar from our Community Health Department. Good evening, everybody, community chairman and uh, alderman. I just uh, want to introduce myself. myself. My name is Jackie Aguilar. I'm the uh, public health nurse manager. And uh, I noticed you had some questions about um, revenue. Um, for uh, immunizations, we usually charge $10, uh, no matter how many immunizations we provide to the um, children in New Hampshire, because the state provides free immunizations to us, and this is just a service fee. Um, same thing happens with the flu vaccine, that we charge $15 per shot. Uh, if the person is insured, we, um, we send them to the providers, but we usually have uh, the $15 flat fee. So our revenues are gonna keep being the same, more or less, because uh, we provide the same immunizations every year. Um, there is also Medicare reimbursement that uh, this year we couldn't attain, but uh, it's all set to be um, uh, starting um, next flu season, we can charge again the Medicare um, um, offices, they cancel our accounts every time there is a turnover of staff, and so we were not able to accommodate, you know, the Medicare to approve us just on time to bill for flu season, but it's going to come up next season. So that's, that's the revenue. Um, in terms of <coughs> overtime, we also had to accommodate for overtime. Uh, because we had uh, our bilingual outreach worker who um, um, is going to do a lot of um, OT, which mean, uh, DOT, which means uh, um, direct observation therapy for our TB patients. And so he's always on the streets looking for these clients that, uh, because he knows the neighborhoods and he is the person that will look for clients for us and also provide that experience uh, education and, and treatment mode that we use for our clinic services. Um, so uh, we 
put a little money there for him. Also, he does a lot of outreach events during the summertime because he's the only one that drives the van, the mobile van. So we needed to accommodate those hours for him. Um, we also have uh, Jamie Terra, which is our administrative assistant. So we put a little money for her just in case the clinics that we had during the evening for either immunization or STD will go over their time allowed. Sometimes there are patients coming in just at the time of closing, and we just put a little money in there for her. And that's basically it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Alderman Lopez. Have you found any in an increase in uh, the number of insured people? And if you have, um, has it impacted how much revenue we get from doing immunizations and that kind of stuff? Uh, unfortunately, no. We haven't had... Actually, uh, a lot of people are going to their PCP, which is great, and they are insured. We don't take insurance at all. So if they are insured, we send them to the PCP. Mm -hmm. But um, usually the uninsured or, or people um, that don't have any other uh, way of uh, medical services come to us um, by word of mouth, and then we refer them to the PCP and, or to apply for insurance services. We refer them to either Lamprey or uh, Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, or Harbor Homes. So. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Yep. All right. Next, we'll hear from Bob Mack, who's our welfare officer. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Uh, I am Bob Mack, a welfare officer for the City of Nashua, manager of the welfare department. I will uh, touch upon the uh, recoveries, uh, the operations budget, and also the general assistance budget for the welfare department. Um, the recoveries, I believe it's on page 45, uh, does indicate a reduction in the projection of recoveries. Uh, we basically are able to recover from um, either clients that return to income status that are able to reimburse us for any assistance, um, liens on any properties we may have and um, any sort of reimbursement from disability programs such as Social Security if and when an applicant uh, that has been pending disability gets approved for that disability, we may be able to recover some of that. So um, honestly, we don't recover a lot over the course of the year, which is why uh, we see the reduction that we have on that, that line. Um, I can move into the operations budget, uh, which is on uh, page 181 and also 188. Um, as Director Bagley mentioned, um, we've had a staff reduction. We had a, um, a changeover. Well, one of the things that we experienced, we had a, a long-term uh, staff person retire. Uh, uh, Terry Charest was our intake worker for 32 some odd years. Um, she retired and the uh, administrative assistant uh, moved into her position. Um, a few months after she had um, retired. Um, so with that, uh, that change, we did reduce our salary line. Um, we also did have a change in staff moving from exempt to non-exempt. We put a very small uh, overtime line in there. We're not projecting really any, any overtime or anything significant, but we did put that in there kind of as a, as a safety net in case we did have any, any overtime. But due to the nature of, of our work, um, they're pretty much in the office, and um, I'm the one who comes to the meetings after hours, so, and I'm, I'm exempt, so it, it doesn't apply to me. So we're all, we're all good there. Um, and then there were just some other minor operational uh, uh, line item adjustments based on uh, trends and in, in usage, which actually weren't very significant. Okay. Questions? Alderman McCarthy. So you're running with, you, you basically have one less person than you did last year. Yes, we're going from seven uh, full-time staff to six um, with the elimination of the administrative assistant. Uh, those duties at this point are being performed by the intake worker as well as the other case technician <coughs> staff. Uh, we're also in the process of trying to fill a vacant case technician position, which has recently it's been advertised. Comfortable, that's a reasonable way to do that instead of having an administrative assistant. Um, that is, uh, we had originally proposed the seven positions and, and the 
the budget the way it's presented now includes uh, the elimination of that position. All set. I guess. Any other questions, Alderman Shelderman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to look at um, the welfare assistance on page 190. Those numbers are sure. are going down. And can you explain again how we are able to to do the job and provide and have it cost less? Sure, I can go through that. Um, some of the changes in that uh, general assistance budget. Um, we uh, basically we assist in, in accordance with RSA 165 with some general basic needs for folks that are poor and unable to sustain themselves. Uh, we assist with uh, shelter or rental costs. Um, we prefer to do homeless prevention rather than homeless assistance. Uh, we assist with some medical costs, primarily prescription costs, um, utility assistance such as uh, electric and, and uh, heating fuel disconnect notices, um, and also some food and personal care items um, on an as-needed basis. Uh, the trends do show a, a reduction in those, those lines. Um, we have had a, a decrease in the number of interviews. If we look at uh, where we are at this point, uh, around 1,200 uh, interviews that were completed to this point in the fiscal year. Um, last year at this time, we were at close to 1,700 interviews. So we're, we're seeing some fewer interviews. I think a, a major part of that is the case technicians and their work with the clients and referral to other programs that have come up in the community. Uh, there have been a number of different programs, uh, rapid rehousing programs, um, some what's called the bridge grant, which is trying to connect folks that have uh, significant mental health issues with housing subsidies. Um, our ability to connect people to those programs has helped to reduce our costs significantly. The challenge we face, though, is that as the more people we refer to those programs, the less money they have to help more people that come down the pipe, if you will. So um, that's why we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic in, in some of the reductions in the, in the line items that we propose. Um, such as the shelter cost for one. That's a that's usually our largest line item. Um, as I mentioned, we want to try to prevent homelessness versus uh, pay to get people back into to housing if, if uh, we can avoid that. Uh, the other line uh, that's some change is the medical line item. Uh, we proposed an increase um, in that. Uh, it's, again, based on um, the unknown as far as with the, the Affordable Care Act and any sort of health insurance changes that may take place at the state or federal level. God bless you. Um, so we're just trying to be cautious and make sure that we have the funds to support people with that, that need for prescription assistance if necessary. Thank you. Well said. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, Laurie. Do we know what's in the Welfare Trust Fund at this point? Yes, it's it's, it's around 358000 I believe. About is approximately 360000 Yeah. Okay. Keep up the good work over there. I think, think you're really doing good things over there. Thank you. Thank you very that. much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none. Director Bagley, thank you very much for thank you, you coming in and all your people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Unfinished business. There is none. none. New business resolutions. I'd like a mo. Um, there is one. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, have somebody make a motion to um, postpone R seventeen one oh two. Oh, I'm sorry, not that one. Wait a minute. Yes, that that one uh, to Thursday night when uh, Alderman Karen can be here. All right, motion's been made by President McCarthy to table R-17-102 to uh, Thursday's budget meeting on the 18th. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. New business ordinances? There is none. Um, anything that anybody wants to take from the table? I don't see any. So, general discussion? Don't see any public comment. There's no one here from the public. <coughs> Remarks by Alderman. Seeing none, we have no need for non public. Do I hear a motion? Just to adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 8.06. All right.